Welcome to the Offshore Club's fun-filled, fact-filled, fast-paced blockbuster podcast, Coffee with Karen Carter, coming to you exclusively from where the sun never sets on the good life at a great price. And now, fill up your favorite coffee mug and join your expert and your guide, Karen Carter Clues. Hello, hello, hello. This is Carib Carter Clues, and welcome to, here we go, Coffee with Carib Carter, episode 87. We've been together a long time, and today, today we're going to do a theme show, okay? The theme is going to be entrepreneurship, okay? Entrepreneurship, and, and you're going to see there's a good reason for it, because the fact of the matter is, I am I believe, and it's based upon a little research, what we're seeing around us in an interview you're going to see in a few minutes, that your opportunity for successfully starting an offshore business, an offshore business in Central or South America, um, is absolutely skyrocketing, skyrocketing, okay? Okay, skyrocketing, yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, I've said it before on this show, I'm going to tell you again, if I had some sons like Steve Jobs and Wozniak, the two Steves, back in 1980, if they were here today and they said to me, hey, Pop, you know, we're thinking of starting a, a computer business in the garage. What do you think? I'd say, great. Just make sure your garage is in Honduras or Nicaragua <laughs> or, or El Salvador or anywhere down south there where you can do it without the government taxing you and regulating you and red taping you and licensing you and permitting you and oppressing you to death. Okay. You can do it. You can do it down there. You got the daring do you'll get it done. Get her done. As Larry, the cable guy says, so that's our theme for today. That's our theme for today. That once you make your move south, you're not going to be able merely to build a business. You're going to be able to, 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 to make a fortune. Okay. Not just make a living, make a fortune. By the end of this, by the end of this podcast today, I think you're going to say, you know what? I think you have a point. It is the land of opportunity down there south of the border now. So we're going to do an interview. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to share with you an interview that I actually did earlier this week, earlier this week with Mike Cobb. Okay, Mike Cobb. It was an interview for his podcast, which is on every Friday. Every Friday at Offshore.club, the Offshore Investment Report, okay? This is the top investment podcast, Offshore Investment Podcast on the Internet. One of the top podcasts, investment podcasts, period, on the Internet. Mike is the Offshore Investment Oracle, okay? He went down there 26 years ago, started out. Didn't own a piece of property, now owns five Caribbean resorts. He knows a little bit about being an entrepreneur south of the border and how you can do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to tell you, introduce a little more later, but stay tuned. You're going to like this. And Mike's a great guy. Those of you who watch his podcast know that already. And this is a great, great interview that, that may have you put on your entrepreneur hat and heading south, okay? Um, in the $1,000 list in Caribbean, I'm going to show you one of the places that I know from experience, from experience, may be a very good place for you to open your own business, okay? Lots of opportunity, and I'm going to tell you why there's lots of opportunity when I share with you this opportunity to invest, invest, okay? In a property investment that I think could trigger your whole entrepreneur uh, success, your whole entrepreneur effort, okay? Uh, very, very inexpensive but could have a huge ROI return on investment, right? And then I have a motivation moment for you with one of my favorite people, one of my favorite people. Unfortunately, he's gone. He's gone, but what an inspiration. Steve Jobs, about a two and a half minute video that I think is going to stimulate your entrepreneurial juices to the max, okay? I mean, let's face it. He was the entrepreneur, uh, one of the great ones of the uh, 20th, 20th century. All right. All right. But it turns out it is also Carib Carter uh, mail call day. So we're going to do that first. We're going to do, but it's going to relate back in a minute. You're going to see why it's all going back to your becoming an offshore entrepreneur. Okay. 
So, but I'm only going to, because, you know, we got so much, we got so much to talk about. I'm only going to do one email I got, okay? One email from James Z. Because I'm not going to give his last name. I'll tell you it's Italian, which I like, of course, because my mother's maiden name was Marciano. Can't get more Italian than that. Yo, Rocky. All right. So here's the letter, okay? And you're going to see how it relates back. Here's the letter, the email I got. Dear Mr. Clues, I love watching y'all Coffee with Care of Carter. Thank you. Thank you, James. I appreciate Thank you. I appreciate that. I watch it every week. Again, thank you. Thank you. I, I, it's fantastic. Uh, a, lot, lot, a lot of people doing these send me notes or text me about it. And I appreciate all that. One time, you promised to tell us more about what you did before you started the Offshore Club. I think it was like, what, six, five or six months ago. Now, I promise I'd start sharing my personal background with you because I think the more you know about a person, the more you feel you can trust them, right? So, and he's right. I did promise that. But you always told us about when you were in politics, okay? So, you know, I spent like, what, 40, 40 years uh, in Washington at the, at the highest, highest levels in politics. Um, and... Uh, you know, remember I told you, somebody said to me once, you know, when you tell people you've been in politics, that's the kind of thing you ought to say in a confessional, which is more and more true, isn't it? But I was. Nonetheless, he says, you told us about when you're in politics. I Googled and found that you were also a big person, I don't know how big I was, in sports handicapping and in infomercials. <laughs> Can you tell us what that was like for you? Thank you, James E. Montreal. We have people up in Canada who who are, are, are Carol Carter uh, friends, okay? Friends. I don't like to say viewers. I say friends because we're all members of the same club, maybe offshore club. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to relate it back to being an entrepreneur because the reason I was able to do both the sports handicapping, okay, and the, the infomercials, and we did have some success, thank God, um, was because the guy who had the companies, who owned the companies, two different two different companies, he owned both of them, was one of the world's great entrepreneurs, okay? And I learned a lot from him, okay? I learned a lot from him. His name was Mike Lasky. Absolutely the most brilliant marketing entrepreneur that I've ever met. And maybe in the history of the world, and you may say, that's a little, a little hyperbole. I don't think it is, and I'll tell you why. Let me just tell you. When I first worked for him, he had founded a handicapping, sports handicapping. Now, for those of you who don't know, it, it, in most states, it's illegal to bet, but it's not illegal to buy sports information and expertise. And Mike was a master handicapper. I mean, in football season, actually in horse racing too, some in basketball, Baseball's not a big gambling sport, so there's not a lot of handicapping in that. But a little bit, not a lot. But in football season, he could pick the winners, I'm telling you. And we had all kinds of clubs you could join. It was Mike Warren Sports, the Gold Key Club, the Platinum Club, the Made Men Club, just on and on and on, right? I wrote for all of them. I was a creative director. But Mike had started out. He moved down from New York, Bensonhurst. He was a New York boy. That's how I talk. And... And he decided he knew it was going to win the Preakness. I think it was 1967. And he sent 250 postcards to friends of his back in New York and said, you send me 25 bucks. I'm going to tell you he's going to win the Preakness. OK, that's how he started out. That's an entrepreneur. By the time he was done, we were making more than 20 million a year. He was America's number one sports handicapper. We had the first ever sports infomercial. You've seen them, you know, these things where you say you've seen them all. I got the winner this weekend, Pittsburgh against uh, the Ravens. I can tell you who win. It's an iron lock guarantee. He invented the term. I got an iron lock, an iron lock play for you. You call 1-800-MIKE-WINS, and I'm going to give you the winner. Okay, absolutely free. Okay. Of course, when they called, you know, they got up soul. They did get a free game. He kept his word, but they got up soul. Um, most unique experience in the world. Most unique. Think about it, folks. If you ever saw the movie, The Lemon Drop Kid, they would sell tip sheets for uh, two bucks, I think, at the gate. He took it from that up to $20 million a year. First 800 numbers ever. First 900 numbers ever. And it came all out of his head. That's entrepreneur. 
And I think a lot of you might be, and all you need is some place to be able to exercise those brain muscles, okay? And enjoy yourself being an entrepreneur. Well, now it's offshore. I swear to God, it's offshore now. That's where to go. You can even be a handicapper and be offshore because, you know, the phone calls and they're free now and you got the internet. It's all there. It's all there, okay? There was, there, there was, sometimes people say, to describe what it was like here, I can describe what it's like for you like this. I got to move quick. Watch the movie Two for the Money, Al Pacino and uh, McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey. It was based on Mike Warren Sports, okay? I was there. Everything you see in that movie, we did. <laughs> Everything you see in that movie. It's, a, it's, you're living on the edge. You know, you're living on the edge. There are some tough guys associated with it. You know, I remember one time, I made the mistake. We had a sports book where we kept all the scores. I'll share this with you. I told my, I told my wife that she was like, what? And so I had to use the sports book because I had to write all the direct mail and the infomercial copy, everything. The, you know, the, and I spilled coffee on it. It was late at night. So the next day, one of the, uh, one of the tougher guys uh, in the organization said, hey, did you spill coffee on the sports book? wasn't the owner. It was another guy working. I see he was a big guy. Looked like Clemenza off the Godfather. I said, well, yeah, a little bit. He said, no, a little bit. You spill a lot of coffee on the sports book and it made it very difficult, very difficult for our people to read what was down there. I said, yeah, geez, I'm sorry. He said, not that. Hey, you do it again, I'm going to kill you. I was like, well, don't you think that's a little extreme? You hear me? Okay. Well, obviously, he wasn't really going to kill me, but it's, it's, uh, you watch the movie. It's, you know, it's a uh, rough milieu in a little a couple of ways, but also incredibly exciting, especially when you're with the entrepreneur who Larry King, I remember had him all one time interviewed him and said, you are the guy who invented the modern handicapping industry. And it was true. OK, so, you know. But the one thing he taught me, I get, how do you keep doing? How do you do? He says, I never look in the rearview mirror. That's why we don't at the, at the offshore club either. We keep moving forward. The other thing I learned with him was the infomercial industry. We pioneered it. We pioneered it. Some of the first ever infomercials. And I'm going to tell you the, the, the largest selling infomercial in history we did because of this guy. And it came all out of his head. It all out of his head. I think you're, you may be the same way. Don't waste it by being up here where you can't afford to, to spread your wings move south the border, you know, you know, you have all the opportunities world without the government there with its hand out and its thumb down. Okay. Hey, you can't do that unless you pay us this money. You're not going to have that down there. Okay. And now with the internet, you can do what you can spread those entrepreneurial wings anywhere. We did the psychic friends network. Yeah. Okay. Some of you are saying, you got to be kidding me. No, no, I was creative director and I wrote them, worked with them. I'll tell you one quick story. I wrote one, one commercial for the Psyche Friends, and it was a commercial for the infomercial, you know, because we ran them all the time. With a, if I said the guy's name and I told you who it was, you would know instantly. He was a very big name back in the 90s, okay? Very big name. So I write the copy for this one minute, in, one minute commercial, I think it was. And the, the camera crew, the director, everybody goes up to, up to uh, New York. That's where the guy had a penthouse, a beautiful penthouse in Manhattan. Um, big star. And uh, so they leave. I'm working the next day or so. And I get a call said, uh, hey, Carter, you, you, you need to rewrite the uh, the commercial. I don't I don't like to rewrite. OK, <laughs> I, don't like, I said, no, they said, man, you, you, you need to re rewrite it. Be, be, I said, well, why don't you just tell him, read what I wrote. It's good. It'll work. It'll sell the product, the Psychic Friends Network, the only billion dollar infomercial in history, by the way. They said, you don't understand. He can't read it because he stutters. <laughs> you would have never known this. And they said he can't do fricatives like, you know, uh, kick the ball. No. Kick, kick, kick. So I had, I had to rewrite it with no fricatives. Try that one on for size. Right. And, and so they, they got the commercial and he did a great job, but you would have never known. So it's a little background, a little background there. But the, so here you had a work for an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, which again, I think some of you are, but you need a chance who 
It was back in the day before the government made it impossible to start a business here in this country now. You, know, you can't even sell a cupcake in this country without OSHA coming and crushing you. Um, but he started two industries. Psyche Friends that work back when we were, when I was, you know, on the team, it was, I remember you're talking night, early 90s. The only infomercial, the only TV show other than I Love Lucy that was on somewhere in the world 24 hours a day. <laughs> That's how big it was, all right? That's how big it was. And all because of one person with an idea who told me, never look in the rearview mirror, okay? Never look in the rearview mirror. Um, and and so that that's the answer to the question, James. That that's that's that helps you understand a little more of my background, folks. I hope I'm not to offend you, but you know, it was a pretty exciting ride. I can tell you that, um, and I'm having it just as an exciting ride, and I hope you are too now with, with with the offshore club. But but what what Mike told me when when you know after I moved on to other things and all, and I said give me some advice that I can pass on to other entrepreneurs. I'm going to pass this on to you now. He said, you need to remember three things. You need to remember three things. He pinched your cheek when he talked to you. Hey, you need to remember three things. You got to step up to the plate. You got to take your best shot and you got to stay in the game. Step up to the plate, take your best shot, stay in the game. He said, you do that. You're going to succeed. That's my advice to you. And where can you do that? South of the border. How do we know? Well, let's go to the interview now. Let's go to my interview with Mike Cobb. Mike is, you know, I call him the offshore investment oracle. He's also, you know, the 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 the, the leading offshore entrepreneur. I don't think anyone has invested more successfully in Central and South America than Mike Cobb. I mean, he and his partner Joel Nagel. You all know Joel. He has a show every Thursday called the uh, Global Wealth Fortress Report, America's number one asset protection attorney. Um, great show, great show. Um, together they own five or six resorts throughout Central and South America, gorgeous resorts. Um, they've done it all. So when Mike talks about making your, what's coming offshore, the advantages of being now an entrepreneur offshore, you need to listen. And I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you right now, the interview is based on this article from Escape Artist Insiders Magazine. It's circling and read there. It's called Mapping the Future. Mapping the Future. And in this article, and go to the link, and, and I talked to the wonderful editor of the magazine, Charlotte Tweed, who also has a podcast at the Offshore.club, Charlotte's Wandering Web, every Tuesday. There you go. Write that down. Go there, because everything you're going to see in this interview Mike talks right, lays out for you in this article. The article is called The Real Life Time Machine. And the fact of the matter is, you are now in a position where you can get in a time machine and you know the future. You go to say, you know what? I'm blabbering on here. It's all in the interviews. <laughs> Let's roll this great interview from with Mike Cobb, the Offshore Investment Oracle. On, Mike. Hey, I'm doing good, Carter. Good to be with you, man. It's good to be with you. In the yeah. in the current issue, this month's issue, October, of the Escape Artist magazine, great magazine. Folks, go to Escape Artist, subscribe to it. It's monthly, 100 pages long every month. The best best international magazine in the marketplace. Mike, in, in that, you have an article. The, the whole magazine's about the upcoming President's Week 26, and we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes if it's all right. But sure. your article about the real life time machine, I thought was captivating. It was absolutely captivating. And let me read one paragraph to you. It's short, folks, so don't leave your seat. Uh, that really, really lays the groundwork on it. Investing in the developing world is like being able to go back in time. With knowledge from our North American future, we can predict and provide the next product or services coming down the road in the developing world, Latin America. This is real investment power, uh, but you can add the supercharger effect if you pay attention to demographics and economics. Explain that to us, because I think it's just it's just captivating. It's intriguing. Thanks, Carter. You know, I, I've written 
I've written articles about this time machine over the years, kind of, I updated each time. I think about it a little differently, uh, but, but is that your time machine, Carter? That is your, that's your, that's the graphics for your article. See the time, there you are. I got are. it. There I, you are driving the machine up, but there we go. There, there, we, go. there we go. All right, good. Um, well, you know, it, it's funny because I, 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 in a lot of my, uh, you know, physical presentations, what I do is, is I, I, you know, I, 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 I kind of get going and then I just like, I stop and I say, all right, everybody, I want you to imagine right now, imagine if HG Wells showed up right here, right beside the stage uh, with his time machine and said, anybody here in the audience, come on, I'll, you know, come to get on this thing with me, bring one check, bring one check. And we're going to go back 10 years and I'll give you all day today to go make one investment. And then we can all jump back on the time machine. We come right back to right here, right now. Excellent. How many people are, how many people are coming back wealthier? Oh, yeah. everybody, right? Well, you know, it's funny. People just kind of sit there. Something like a bumps on a log. <laughs> I was like, hello, <laughs> like, who's coming back wealthier? You know, right? Anyway. And so, okay. Yeah. But, but the point is, is that like, yeah, hindsight is 2020. And, and when you work in the developing world, and you said Latin America, and, and that's where we work, and I'm very familiar with the territory and have, you know, 20, yeah. 26 years now with ECI and 29 years with our mortgage company. So almost 30 years working in the region, right? You know, I'm, I, I, I feel very comfortable there. But, you know, the same thing's true in Africa, in the developing parts of Southeast Asia. So it's the developing world, right? Because certain things happen, right? Now, Let's be clear, and I'll give you one example where where a bet on something wouldn't have paid off. If you'd have been putting copper wires for telephone lines in the developing world, right in Africa, especially, you know, maybe ten years ago, you, you'd have been you'd have been sunk because everything went Wi-Fi, everything went yeah, you know, cell phone, Wi-Fi, right, satellite, and so yeah. that that was probably not that. In fact, that's a very good example of how it doesn't always follow the same path, right? But by and large, development follows a similar path over time, right? And, 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 and so products and services, you know, if, you know, if you have the first McDonald's in a country, you're going to do really, really well. And, and you know, and, and I hear this all the time, like, oh, how would you bring McDonald's? It's horrible. Like, I don't, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. So if it's so horrible, then the consumers won't show up to eat it, right? But you yeah. know what? You build the first McDonald's in a country, there are lines out around the block to get in. Horrible Absolutely. or not horrible, like, you know what? People want it. And, you know, and so my whole point is, like, if, if, if it's McDonald's, then the next one might be KFC or Pizza Hut or Burger King. I don't know, whatever. I mean, I'm just saying, like, you yeah. can look at this trend and you can say, well, you know what? The first McDonald's and Burger King are there. You know what? I want to open a, I want to get the Pizza Hut franchise. I want to open the pe first Pizza Hut yeah. or whatever, right? Or uh, you know, or, or and and other things in terms of like services, right? The kinds of services that happen in a in a developing country, like title insurance, right? And we talked about that last week or the week before last. You know, it's more right. like fifteen questions, right? And so right now in the developing world, there's not a lot of title insurance, but but it will come, right? It will come, and so that's an idea of a service that that will happen as development proceeds. So this idea of a time machine. It's powerful, Carter, because if you see what's there, you look at what North America, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then then, and right? Okay, you can put yourself kind of right in front of it. You can put yourself a little further out in front of it. You know, if you get too far out in front of it, you, you might be, the, the lag might be too long or or you might miss a technology like yeah. Wi-Fi or cell comes along and all of a sudden the wires don't happen and like, oh, you know, miss that one, right? So so again, it's an important it's an important element of, you know, the closer you are to what's next, the more probability that what's next will kind of follow what happened other places. And it's not just the U.S. You can look at what happened in Europe. You can look what happened in Australia. You can look at what happened in Japan and, and Taiwan and, 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 and even in the developing world, different countries are at a different point, right? Yes. So you could go and look at, if you could, you know, you go look at Costa Rica and it's hard if you haven't worked there, but again, I've been in the region for 30 years. I know what Costa Rica was like 30 years ago and, and Panama was like 30 years ago. And I know what it's like today. And then you see a country like Nicaragua, that's much further back on the development curve, even in the region, right? And you go, well, what's next? What's next? Right? So, oh, there you go, Carter. Good, good man. There you go. 
And, yeah. and by the way, that is a better than me flying the little time machine. That is a much better representation of time machine. That right there. Oh, that's is, great. Yeah, that that's, that's great. the time machine, Carter. That right there is the time that's machine. That's it. That's it. Yep. yep. I mean, I yep. fell in love with that the first time I saw it in the consumer resource guide. Yep. It's just it's fantastic. And, and Mike, I think I think there's an advantage here that you point out in your article, okay? You point out that according to Zogby, Zogby did a poll, massive poll. 103,000 103, U.S. citizens were surveyed. 100,000 exactly. people surveyed. That's huge. 100, you're right. 103,000. 103, and found out that 11.6% or 26 million of them had intended to invest or move offshore, own property or move offshore. Yeah. Well, well, Mike, we know what those people like. Because they're in the U.S. Right. So what are they going to look for? Right? Am I right when they move to Nicaragua, Honduras, right. or wherever? Yeah. I, you know, they, they want they want hot water at all their bathrooms. They want plumbing that works. Uh, they want countertops at the right height. They want the lighting in the bathroom in front so it comes on their face instead of behind them. And, I mean, right. And, and, and so, yes, that, that's right. They have an expectation of a standard of product that they're yes. used to in the States. And so when they go overseas, the people that can deliver that standard of product, that familiarity of product, uh, will absolutely be winners in the marketplace. Absolutely. Winners in the marketplace. And yep. in your article, you point out that of that 103,000, 17% or 4.5 million are their interest in moving or owning property is in Latin America. Right here. Yes. Where you, you were the pioneer. 26 years ago, you went down and said... I'm going to buy here because I know the future. And of course, you turned out to be exactly right, which makes this article all the more credible yeah. because you've done it. We, we, we have, Carter. And, yep. you know, it, it's uh, it, it's nice to have predicted the future well in this case. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And then let's add another aspect to it, Mike. All right. You're you're you have said, you know, you want to go down there. You, we know we know the baby boomers are coming. We know they're coming. 26 million Americans say they're looking to move offshore, large number to sent to Latin America. And we know, you, you point out in the article again, the Ernst & Young, the Ernst & Young report study, which yeah. is just is stunning, but all of us know it's true. Anybody that knows baby boomers, knows retirement age people, knows this. 60% of America's baby boomers, retired age people, Nope. will not be able to afford to live in the U.S. Right. Uh, it, correct. Uh, you know, and, well, and it breaks my heart, Carter. It breaks well, my heart. I mean, people yeah. have paid into people have paid into Social Security. By the way, I'm I'm actually not sure that's true because I think the government will figure out a way either through inflation or whatever to, to take care of the baby boomers. Right. It's it's the next generations after the baby boomers well, yeah. who I really feel sorry for. Because I, th there is going to be no money for them, right? There, there will be no money for them. No, um, no. Yeah. Well, no. But yeah, but but we say the government will take care of them. So the government just announced that those on Social Security are getting eight point three percent increase in their Social Security next mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Unfortunately, inflation is at eight point eight percent. So what the hell kind of increases? <laughs> well, and, and I'm sorry, and that and that's today's measurement. If I, I love. Uh, uh, John Williams. Uh, the, no, no, the, the 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 website that you can go to. Gosh, I, I was thinking of it the other day. Shadow web, stats. Shadow stats. Thank yeah, you. John Williams. Shadow stats. Oh, oh yeah. John Williams. Right. Yeah. And if you plug in inflation, today's inflation, how Carter measured it, how Reagan measured it, how Bush yeah. measured it, right? Hell, how Obama measured it. Pick one, right? It's not eight percent. It's no. way higher than eight percent. So, so it's just it's it's all you know trick foolery. To like, if we don't like the number, we can look. If you put big screen TVs into your inflation index, yeah, they they come out. The giant TV comes out at five thousand dollars, and three years later, it's you know it's eight hundred ninety nine bucks. Well, guess what? That's a great anti inflation example, right? Yeah. But if you put health care, if <laughs> right, you know, fuel prices, uh, medicine prices, medical care, you put those into the equation, college tuition. I mean, you know, whatever, right? Although old people probably aren't paying college tuition, but medical care, medicine, uh, fuel costs, uh, I mean, uh, all of those things that are sort of the food, food, food costs, right? You food put all costs, those gas things, costs. Gas, gasoline, right? Fueling, yeah, right. Heating yeah. and 
right? You put all those in, like all of a sudden the inflation index isn't 8.3%. It's a lot higher. And so, you know, you can play with the numbers and and they are going to continue to play with the numbers. So the, the real question is, even if the government kind of sort of keeps up with it, quality of life standard of living is going to drop. In fact, a great economist, Mark Skousen, uh, gave me an example one time and I thought it was brilliant. He said, you know, inflation is the government's solution to the unfunded you know, mandates like Social Security. Right. And yeah. he said, and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, look, here's how it works today. You know, let's say Social Security payment of two thousand dollars a month, you know, for for a couple or whatever, you know, twenty five hundred, whatever it is. Right. They can afford to have a really nice dinner every night. Maybe they can eat steak a couple nights a week, baked potato, broccoli, you know, whatever, you know, glass of milk. You know, he said, <laughs> but in, you know, but, but if inflation is is, you know, six, seven percent. Right. He said in 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 10 years. Right. They're going to have chicken maybe some mashed potatoes, some, you know, canned corn, right? And in 10 more years, they're going to have a hamburger and some French fries. And in 10 more years, going to have a hot dog and some chips. And in 10 more years or whatever it was over, it was like over a 30 year period. He says, you know, they're going to have spam and, and, and leftover spinach, but, but True. the same money, same $2,500 a month. It, yeah. They're still, they're still eating dinner every night. They're still full. Their bellies are still full, but they're not eating steak and baked potato anymore. They're eating spam and spinach. Right. And and he says that is the way governments are going to manage these these unfunded mandates. They will continue to take care of people. People won't starve to death. You know, socialized medicine, everything free. We're seeing I mean, we're already moving into all that stuff. Right. But the problem is it's rationing. I mean, look, at the end of the day, Carter, like there's only so much to go around and you can you can distribute it many different ways. The free market distributes it on price. Right. Uh, you know, uh, communist countries dist distribute it on party loyalty. Hey, if you're a loyal party member, you get the best yep. hospitals and right. And, 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 you know, and, and I think the American version is going to be a lot like the Canadian version where, you know, if, if you can afford to pay for it, you can. And if you can't, you're just going to wait long lines and, and six months and eight months or a year for things. And, you know, so, so, you know, it, it is a rationing of a limited service. So, you know, I think these are the kinds of things that that North American retirees will face over the next 30 years. And, oh, yeah. and there are better alternatives. There are absolutely better alternatives. I mean, my wife and I lived in in Nicaragua for for 14 years, Carter. We had a quality of life that was incredible. And $2,000, dollars a month. Oh, my gosh. You're going to eat organic fruits and vegetables, free range, you know, uh, meats and Beef. hormone yeah. free cheeses. Yeah. And, right. You're going to have this incredible quality of life and your medical care will be phenomenal. My wife, I mean, my wife had a mammogram done right recently. And apparently, uh, you know, she has dense breasts. Right. And, and about 55 percent of women have a dense breast, which means the standard mammograms don't read it very well. Right. And so she had to go back to her doctor. She read about it, she heard a podcast. It was uh, uh, about a lady that had dense breasts and they didn't catch it, a, a tumor or whatever. And now it's bad, right? So anyway, oh, yeah. so so anyway, so she called her her doctor and said, "Hey, I, I want to get this ultrasound or sonogram or whatever the the next thing is where you can actually see through the dense breast, right?" Yeah. yeah. Anyway, and 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 Carol said to me the other day, yesterday, day before yesterday, I'm traveling now, so it was day before yesterday. She says, "You know what? When I when we were living in Nicaragua." They always gave me a sonogram. I'm just like, right. Meta and, and instead of $400, because this is out of pocket, so we're going to have to pay for her sonogram because it's not covered by insurance. Okay, okay, right? The sonogram in Nicaragua was 60 bucks. 60, 60 bucks. 60 bucks, as opposed to 400 That's it. Right? But it was standard procedure. And so well, yeah. people start to say, oh, the medical care is you know, south of the border. It's horrible. Actually, you know what? Carol, my wife, right? About as conservative, you know, diehard American as you can get, you know, basically said, you know, the medical care we got in Nicaragua was actually better. And I'm like, yes, it was, honey. Yes, it was. It was. It was and, it was like, and it was, and it was like whatever, you know, whatever. I don't know what, I don't know what 60 into 400 is, but, you know, like, you know, 80% cheaper or something. Or I don't know, whatever the math oh, yeah. on that is. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, well, a couple of weeks ago, when uh, on, the, on uh, Joel's program, the, the, um, Global Wealth Fortress report, he was saying he had a complete physical in Belize, top yeah. to bottom, yep. and it was $108. Probably would have cost 10000 here. He, he, he said yeah, it was yeah. totally comprehensive. Right. The executive, the executive physicals, I would get them when we lived in Nicaragua. That's right. They were a little bit more, but you know, they but they included like the whole 
you know, colonoscopy and endoscopy and they put you to sleep and, you know, then the heart run on the treadmill. And I mean, the whole thing, the, you know, sonograms, x-rays, the whole shooting match, right? And it was, it was just a little under 500 bucks. But again, that's 10% of what it would cost in the U.S., right? Five, oh, 10 yeah. grand in the U.S. to have that kind of, you know, uh, set of procedures and executive physical done. So, right, inexpensive, 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 and, inexpensive. Comprehensive you know. and, and, and truly, and, and most of these doctors, many, many, not most, many of these doctors trained in the United States. Oh, yeah. Many of them trained in Europe, which, okay. Yeah. And, and a yeah. lot of them trained in Mexico, which again, you know, great, great healthcare. And, and people just don't understand how, how good the healthcare can be overseas. Uh, it's hard, yeah. it's hard to fathom it, but. Yeah. No, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I don't know why, but it just flashed through my mind where we you're talking about a products, about products you could bring south of the border. And for some reason, it, it, it resonated. I remember missing when I lived in Honduras, missing butterscotch crimpets. Right. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. But, but uh, and it relates back to the cost of living in the U.S. Now, Mike, have you had a butterscotch crimpet lately? I don't think I've ever had one, Carter. <laughs> you, oh my God, tasty cake, tasty cake. It, All right. They are. When I was a kid, you got three in the package, three. Now you get two, and they're only two thirds of size. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna look. Butterscotch crimpet, Butter, and, tasty cake, butterscotch tasty crimpet. Cake. Okay, well, you know, I love the, I, I love the little darlings. I love the ho hos, the Twinkies. So, okay, so I'll be looking for the butterscotch. <laughs> I bet you all of those are smaller, but but they go back. Yeah. You know, I'm being facetious, but they do go back to the cost yeah. of living here now, and the fact that there are a million and one products and services you can bring, as you point out in this great yeah. article, the Time right. Machine article, you can bring south of the border. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's excellent. It is. Hey, Carter, I I, I have to go in like one minute. And, one minute. And <laughs> one minute. I got to roll. I, got, I have another call and I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm traveling and, and everything kind of got backed up. I was sl slightly delayed on my flight. So I'm, I'm running All behind right. schedule. But the but, other thing we're going to talk about today is President's Week. And the only thing yes. I'm going to say about President's Week is this. If you, if you think that owning a time machine would make you wealthier, <laughs> and I hope you put your hand up and say, yes, if I had a time machine, I'd be a lot wealthier, right? Yes. If you believe that, you need to come to President's Week. Absolutely. Get the information, come to President's Week. We're going to talk about time machine. We're going to talk about asset protection. We're going to talk about uh, compliance. We're going to talk about lots of different things at that conference. The, truly, some of the world's best experts uh, are there. It's an incredible lineup. Just request the information. You'll see the speaker list. I mean, it, it's 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 Swiss money managers. It's it's uh, people, uh, European gold and silver people, uh, uh, I, I can't remember who, who some of the other speakers are right at the time. I mean, it, it's just Joel Nagel, world uh, class uh, asset protection, second yeah. resident, second citizen, number one attorney, number, number one in the world. world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just an incredible lineup of people, uh, and and the attendees uh, likewise are incredible. It's a it's a great group of folks who who come together once a year. It's the twenty sixth annual Presidents Week. And Fantastic. it is it is phenomenal. Uh, so uh, yeah, please request the information. Do it. Come join us, and uh, yeah, Carter. There you go. That's right. Yep. And we'll be both. We'll both be there. Yes, we will. There you go. All, All right. right, Mike. Carter, how to run, man? Had I known Thank you were such a rush, I went to throw hey, in the butterscotch crimpets. <laughs> that, that's okay. Butterscotch crimpets are good. Hey, Carter, let's let's do this thing, man. <laughs> let's do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Wow, wow, wow. Imagine, imagine knowing the future, knowing what's coming down the pike and being able to be there and reap the rewards from the four, not the knowledge you have, the foreknowledge you have. You know what these 26 million Americans who are looking to move offshore are going to want when they arrive. So be there with your lemonade stand and sell it to them. <laughs> It can't get any simpler than that. And where do, would I recommend you do that? Well, a lot of places throughout Central or South America. One place in particular we're going to look at now with our $1,000 listing Caribbean, okay? I know a little bit about this place because I lived there six months. It's called Roatan Island, okay? Roatan Island. 
it's it's offshore. It's part of it's owned by Honduras, but it's offshore. There's three Bay Islands, and then I'll show you a map in a minute. But Roatan's one of them. To let you know what Roatan is like, it is Paradise Island. Okay, Gary, let's show them the, the short clip we have, the video excerpt from a video that shows you what life is like on Roatan Island. Let, let's let's roll. Let's go to the video, as Warner Wolf used to say. There you have it. there you have it a, a little overview for you so let's look at a property there because i'm telling you let me put it in perspective roatan island gets 250,000 250,000 tourists a year I suppose you just made a buck off each one not a bad living 250,000 and it's rising as more and more people discover it okay there are about 80,000 people there already i'd say a good tenth of them are expats okay Maybe more because they're not just from Canada and the U.S. When I lived there, I realized I was surrounded by Italians, which was great for me, and Arabs, Israelis, right there in Roatan, right there in Roatan. So building all that with your 250,000 tourists coming each year you know, on the cruise ships, and this is called opportunity, folks. This is called opportunity. So let me show you a property that you might want to think about investing in, okay? It's from Vivion. You know how much I love Vivion. I bought two homes off Vivion. All right. All right. There's Vivion. You see the little number there. All right. And that you go, go to Vivion, type the number in the little box. I always tell you this up in the right-hand corner. Hit the, click on it. There we go. Thank you, Gary. That's your number. All this property I'm going to show you, this is it, okay? Unique waterfront property in Roatan. Waterfront property. It's hard not to be a waterfront property. It's an island, <laughs> okay? It's an island. It's about, uh, I think, 32 square miles, maybe 48 miles long, and at the widest, five miles wide, okay? So it's an island. So wherever you are, you're essentially on the water. This is a good place. This is a good place. Piece of paradise oceanfront property, Okay. Located, uh, it's called Terra Chula. It's a long established, it, 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 they built it in, in an area called Jonesville Point. I'm going to show all this to you, okay? I'm going to say it's a piece of property, okay? It's a piece of property, about, about an acre. You're going to get an acre of property on the water, on the water, on both the ocean and, 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 and the, the lake, okay? On the ocean and the lake, 90 feet of waterfront, okay? for one acre of property on Roatan Island, one of the most popular islands in the Caribbean with 90 feet of waterfront. They're asking $117,500. $117, I'd, I'd offer them 100. It, trust me, it's worth it. You're gonna get the return a million times over, please, please. Zero HOA, there are other homes there. There are other homes there now. Um, dock right there, everything you could want, okay? Already has the electricity, already has the water. And 
the road leading to it is mostly concrete. So it's a good opportunity. It's a good opportunity to get in early. All right. So let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at it. The reason I'm telling you, you get it, you get it. And number one, you have a great investment. That's just going to rise as more and more tourists come to Roatan and more and more expats move in, which increases every day. Um, and, and number two, if you live there yourself, it's a pretty good life. I can tell you, I live there. Well, I always tell people, when you can jog along a pristine white sand beach and watch the starfish swim by beside you, that's pretty idyllic, isn't it? <laughs> that's pretty idyllic, but that's what I did every day, okay? All right, Honduras, Let's. we always like to look at the map, okay? You see Honduras there, all right? You see Honduras, all right? It's down there beneath uh, Guatemala. Under you, Mexico, Guatemala, and you see Honduras, all right? There's Honduras. I told you it was a Bay Island, right? I told you the Bay Islands. Here's your coast of Honduras, and there it is, the one with the little red the balloon on it. That is Roatan Island, the bigger of the three islands, okay? The other two, Roatan is, is still pristine, but it's got enough life on it, as you saw from the video, to have very nice social life. The other two are still pr pretty... Uh, I'm not going to say primitive, but undeveloped, okay? If you look close, you see La Ceiba. See La Ceiba there, where I have my home? You get the ferry right across. You can get the ferry from La Ceiba, the mainland, over to the island. I can't because I get seasick, but maybe you can, okay? I told you it's from Jonesville. Jonesville is one of the oldest communities on Roatan Island, okay? It's an older community. I'm going to show you, you know, you're, you're going to show you a little picture of it here. Here's the, here's the view. Here's the view, the long view of the area where you're buying this acre of property on the water. See the water? You're on the water. Acre of property. Here's Jonesville. Jonesville, I've been there. I've been there. Spent some time there. This is kind of like just a fishing village, okay? Okay? Kind of like a fishing village. You know, you have to get a little bit of Venice filled with the canal there because you can go everywhere by boat. All right. Nothing fancy there. Nothing fancy there. Just a very, very pleasant life. Here is the actual community. Okay. Terra All right. Again, this is not a residential resort community. Okay. It's not like Grand Pacifica with all the amenities or even where my home is in Honduras. So save a beach club, you know, gated, guarded and all that. This is just a, you're part of the Jonestown community here, okay? It's community. It's community, all right? Another view of it, because I want you to see what we're talking about here. This is where you're going to be living. Picture yourself there. Very copacetic, very tranquil. Tranquilo, as we say in Spanish, very serene. Very serene. And here's the kind of house that you're probably, you buy that property. This is what most of the homes around you look like at this point, okay? And it is what I would think of building if I were you, all right? And then what do you do with it? Well, here we go, being the entrepreneur, all right? Here's their artist rendering. If you go to their website, here's their, it's uh, Terra Chula, T-E-R-R-A-C-H-U-L-A. -R -R there's a rendering of the home they can build you for, they say, 140000 or 49000 I think you can get it cheaper. I think you can get it cheaper. But that one is... Uh, you know, you're talking four bedrooms, two baths, very, very nice. Very, so for you to live in, very accommodating for you to rent out, for you to rent out, okay, at Terra Chula Village, where they have other rentals, okay, is cash flow. How good a cash flow? You want to be the entrepreneur? How good a cash flow? I'm suggesting to you probably 100 to 150 a night, Okay. Uh, and remember, 250,000 tourists come to Roatan Island every year. Some want to stay for, you know, a week, okay? People vacation there. It's a wonderful vacation spot. So now you have a home, okay, that you've put together for, what, 250,000 total. Can you imagine any island in America? It would be 10 times that much for you to build a home there that size. Four bedroom? Come on. Come on. 250,000. That's you own the land. You own the land, an acre on the water, 90 front feet of ocean, of waterfront, okay? Um, in, in a real community, all right? 
right there near the gourd where you saw the footage of Roatan Island. That's where these people are going to want to go play and have fun, enjoy themselves. You've got it all and you're getting 100 to 150 a night. That's pretty good entrepreneurship. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, you might want to think of starting with one, getting another. There's still a, lot, a good many vacant lots of Terracotta, ter, ter, Terracotta, Terracula. Um, and I don't remember, I don't get any money out of this, none whatsoever. So drive your own deal with the, with the owners there. Drive your own deal. Always drive your own deal. Um, and bring the price down. Okay. You're in the driver's seat. You're along with the money. Um, and so you get your cash flow plus your equity bill. That's good entrepreneurship. Okay. That's good entrepreneurship. That's why I'm recommending it to you. I'm going to say something. And I want you to take it to heart. You cannot go wrong with Roatan Island. You cannot go wrong with Roatan Island. It is on the ascendancy. It already is lovely. I lived there about eight years ago now. It was lovely then. It still just has a wonderful, quaint feel to it. And it's going to continue. It's going to continue to expand with more Americans coming, more Europeans coming, Arabs, Israelis, everybody. Get there now. Be the entrepreneur who makes the money. Okay? Okay? And that brings me to my motivation moment. I like this a lot. I like this motivation moment a lot. Um, because I, I love the guy. If any of you get a chance to read uh, Isaacson's book called Jobs, I think you're going to be real inspired by it. Okay? I mean, the guy... He's a tremendous mastermind. He's kind of like the Edison of his time, a real entrepreneur, which I, again, I think a lot of you may be too. Okay. And so I want you to take a look at this wonderful video, this wonderful video um, in which Steve Jobs, it's only about two and a half minutes, encourages you to pursue your dreams as an entrepreneur the way he did. The, the setbacks, so what? Setbacks, so what? You know, go for it. All right. Let's check it out, Gary. I was lucky. I found what I loved to do early in life. Waz and I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard, and in 10 years, Apple had grown from just the two of us in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I just turned 30. And then I got fired. How can you get fired from a company you started? What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, and it was devastating. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. I felt that I had let the previous generation of entrepreneurs down. I was a very public failure, and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. We are going to make it or break it based on whether we can provide products to higher education and services and relationships to higher education that no one else provides. And I think we ought to spend 100% of our time thinking about that. And if we can't do that, then we ought to go broke. And so I decided to start over. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pixar, and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. And that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. So keep looking, don't settle. There you
you go. I love that last quote they have on the screen because it says it all for us, doesn't it? Those of us who are entrepreneurs who want to make our move offshore, we're pioneers, we're entrepreneurs, we're leaders. Leaders, you're a leader. You are a leader, okay? I love that last quote. Have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary, okay? So put first things first. Be an offshore entrepreneur. There's gold in them, their hills. There's gold on them, their islands. So as I always tell you every week, let's do this thing.